Welcome to episode 10 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday the 3rd of August 2009 and in this episode we are going to interview KB Singh from the CentOS team. We'll cover the latest news and events. We'll have some command line love followed by the second part of our interview with Dustin Kirkland. Then we'll do the competition Ecosphere and Feedback. I'm Dave and with me this week is Tony. Hi Dave. Hello Tony, how have you been? Oh, not too bad. I've been doing Ubuntu server upgrades at work. It's been great. Mm. Oh, from what to what? Dapper to Hardy on, on the server. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Don't you have a man to do that? Um, yeah, I have several men. No, hang on. That sounds wrong. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. And I do those sort of things myself. Did you do it direct from... Because Dapper is LTS and so is mm. Hardy. Did you do it direct? Yeah. Using do release up, upgrade. And it worked? It, yes. Um, on one server, it uninstalled NTP. But other than that, it was all good. Cool. Just out of interest, any reason for doing that? I mean, that app is still supported and will be supported for the next few years. Yeah, just that most of them are web servers, so newer versions of PHP. Yeah, and some of the applications we're running need them, so nothing, no, no major real, real push to do it. Just felt like it was a good time. It's the summer. Sounds good. <laughs> oh, somebody sort it all out. Yeah, exactly. If I break it, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. In his flip flops, and then I've got another four years before it goes end of uh, Hardy goes end of, end of life. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Alan, what have you been doing? Loads, actually. Um, oh, we haven't got time for all of that. Just cherry pick the best stuff. Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. That shut me up. Um, okay. I used DVD rip for the first time. Oh, yeah. You know, the thing that you mm. chuck a DVD in and it just rips it. And I thought that was good, even though I'm sure that's probably illegal where I am. Depends um, on the DVD. It's one of your homemade DVDs. No, hang on. That sounds wrong as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tried out Jolly Cloud on my E. We'll probably talk more about that later. It's an mm-hmm. Ubuntu derived thing on my epc yeah i think we mentioned it earlier in the season didn't we yes um i reinstalled mythbuntu oh um and i haven't really used it much yet because i don't have my um aerial amplifier but more about that later <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you all about that <laughs> and i bought a new acer aspire revo um a cheap computer that's based on that nvidia ion thing the new thing it's quite good yeah. We're using it now, and it works on the <laughs> telly. HDMI, you owe me 50p, Dave, because you said the audio wouldn't work out of the box. I didn't, I didn't realise you were intending to use Karmic. I thought you were going to use a stable release. Now he tries to get out. You of it. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Now, Simon, what have you been doing? I have been the Ubuntu UK podcast uh, courier. Excellent. Oh, yeah, I, I heard a bit about yeah. this. Yeah. What, well, what Adrian, uh, Adrian, who won the um, Viglan. Oh, about, the little computer from yeah, last yeah, week. lives just about uh, half an hour from me on the road to devices. So I got the box off um, Mr. Pope. That's I the had one. It. Yeah, I had uh, it. And uh, chucked it on the back of my bike because I was going up to devices, thrashed on down to Adrian's, pulled up, gave him the box. He was very happy. Yeah, he got the Viglan. I rode away. Yeah, and it's always nice to meet our uh, meet nice. our audience. Yeah, it sounds um, like a superbly executed delivery. Like that, I, I, I'm not seeing it, any problem. There. It was great, no. apart from about 20 minutes later, he sent me a text message saying, "Yeah, I love, <laughs> love my ass off." Um, I delivered him a um, TV power amplifier. What? Why, why did you do that? I've no idea. Ask Popey. You've got a Viglan. What, 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 what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I, I get. I I rushed when I came down here. I rushed out the house and I grabbed the first box that a Viglin would normally be in. It actually as I, as does say in. Viglin on the box. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it probably has my address on it. And I gave that to Simon without opening it up and looking at And what was inside was me having tied it away, uh, an aerial amplifier and some cables. So that's what Adrian received. <laughs> I suspect he was actually trying to see whether he'd notice or not. <laughs> because <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder whether the actual um, whether the actual piece of equipment he received was potentially more powerful. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> mm. more uh, he was very good about it so uh, we're going to get uh, the pucker thing to him uh, as soon as we can and to be honest he got off quite lightly really because he could have had your old socks in it or anything yes some random box grabbed from your den well you know in the future it might be worth an awful lot of money <laughs> <laughs> pair of my old socks what parallel universe is that in yes uh, what else I've been um, playing with uh, well IRSSI or ERSI or depending on uh, where you come from mm. that, that's the um, console based IRC client yeah, isn't it that's right um, getting Twitter and my IM clients up and working again um, Twitter on IRS or on ERSI I hadn't done before and um, Popey said he used it and so yeah why not I was getting sick to death of Gwibber failing so mm. uh, uh, now it's all in one place so that's me 
What about you, mate? What have you been up to? Well, I've mainly been sporting uh, quite an interesting cold, actually. It's been keeping me quite bunged up. Excellent. So, so that's been my main interest. And, and actually, it has had a, um, a reduction in my productivity. But yes, that's been quite fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice um, snort. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, additionally, I've been working on so, some other general stuff. Um, traditionally, uh, at this point, I normally go into too much detail and say what, I'll be, what I've been doing. So if I just say I've been doing some stuff... So as ever, you were going to tell us the, nothing. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay. so I've been involved with um, doing web server stuff and doing some, um, some additional packaging stuff. Yeah. So oh, cool. Captain Elusive, well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm trying to get the blend just right. Either I, talk to, either I tell you too much detail and, and to bore you to death. Well, what's the that? most interesting thing you've been packaging? Snot. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a fun pack show. <laughs> okay, we've got a guest here, um, somewhat different from uh, usual. Uh, someone completely, effectively outside the Ubuntu project, um, and his name is, or he's known as KB Singh, and he represents um, CentOS for us today. Hiya, how are you doing? Hi, good, good. How are you guys doing? Uh, not bad. Oh, yeah, not too bad, thank you. Um, First of all, obviously the the first question we're all mainly Ubuntu users. So the first question really is: um, Can you give us a, a rundown of what CentOS is, or CentOS, I believe is the correct pronunciation, and what its relationship is to Red Hat Linux and Fedora? Uh, many years back, well, a couple of years back, four or five years back, Red Hat changed its uh, business policies, where they took their primary Linux offering off the market and they said, "Look, we're just not going to do something open anymore." and um, we're going to have a product called RHEL, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux platform. And they forked off a, a developer or a targeted distribution called Fedora, which is completely community driven. Um, and Centos sort of came up to fill in that void in that it takes what is Red Hat Enterprise Linux and makes it available to people who uh, don't need the support from Red Hat, who can support themselves, or people who just need a platform that they can build an application on. Um, at its core, it's the same source code that goes into RHEL. Um, as far as the users are concerned, it's different in that you don't get the support from Red Hat and you don't get, all, obviously, all the business stuff that comes with it, like you know the liability insurance and the business insurance and things like that that you get from Red Hat. Um, yeah, so basically, as far as the distribution is concerned, that's what it is. Okay, um, but something that interests me is that there's another one I'm aware of called Whitebox Linux, which promises to be a similar thing. Uh, how does how does Cent- CentOS actually vary from that? Uh, did you know? Um, yes, actually, I started using Whitebox before uh, before CentOS happened. Um, Whitebox was going to be something very similar to what CentOS is today, except that Whitebox was run only by one guy, and he refused all outside help. And uh, when you've got five people who are using the distribution, one guy's probably enough. But then that becomes 100, 150. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a bit hard. And even things like mailing lists became a problem. And then one fine day he decided uh, he just didn't want to play this game anymore, um, which, is, which, which worked out really well for CentOS because that's, uh, most of the developers actually were immigrants from Whitebox. So what sort of people use CentOS then as opposed to Fedora? Um, it's, it's a completely different target game in, the, in that most of the people using CentOS tend to be people who uh, just want to put together a system and, and not have to worry about it too much. So, you know, uh, traditional industries like the hosting business, hosting is a big is a big thing. VoIP is, again, very big. People who are into VoIP are using CentOS quite a bit. People who are doing application development uh, on things like Ruby on Rails and things like that, they tend to be very heavy users of CentOS. And, of course, Red Hat does a lot of virtualization stuff, uh, and that all of those technologies percolate down. So again, on the uh, on the cloud uh, side of thing and and on the virtualization thing, the VPS is on the internet. CentOS has been really big. Okay, um, one thing um, I, I'm, I'm aware of is with a lot of Linux distributions, you get two variants. You get a desktop and a server edition. Uh, do you actually have a, uh, a a desktop edition with CentOS, or is it purely uh, aimed at the server market only? Um, well, Red Hat Enterprise Linux has variants. They have a workstation, a desktop, a server, a cluster store, or whatever. We just roll everything into one distribution, um, and it's left up to the user to see how they want to use it. So, so using CentOS, you can install the likes of GNOME, KDE, and, and, and the other window managers and such? Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, yeah, it's got, a full, it's got a full desktop thing. You've got OpenOffice, you've got Firefox, you've got Thunderbird, which are both tracking the latest releases. Um, 
you've got um, you know even the snazzy graphics and things like that, like Compass and AIGLX and things like that are all, all included. So when you when you take um, your code base from from Red Hat, um, you you strip out all the the Red Hat um, trademarks. I take it to you know so that you're not infringing any of their um, their yes, property. Yes, um, all artwork, which is um, of course Red Hat copyright, has to go. Um, all trademark uh, stuff has to go. Um, we also remove certain things which are specific to the Red Hat platform for things like they have something called RHN, the Red Hat Network. So all of the tools and code included in the distribution to work with RHN is taken out. Because and you know we don't want we don't want people using CentOS actually hitting the servers and causing traffic to them. Sure. And and as you've been going for a while and you've had a number of releases, do you is that now pretty much an automatic process? You know, you know which bits need to be ripped out. So, you know, you you end up with a your pure, you know, non Red Hat. <laughs> I don't want to say the word tarnished, but you know, yeah. <laughs> you you end up with your pure CentOS, um, um, and that's is that some sort of automatic programmatic thing? Yeah, we, we've got um, the actual patching uh, in what and outward happens manually. Somebody has to do it themselves. Wow. But the amount of code we have to change is not much. It's it's only about six percent of the overall distribution. So, do you have things that replace Red Hat Update Network and and those bits? Well, we have uh, the CentOS Mirror Network, which works over YUM, uh, which is purely client end. Uh, Red Hat have, of course, RHN, which works in the server end as well. As in, you know, you get a nice management web UI that you can control your machines with and things like that. Oh right, okay. Um, so it's not just a little icon in a system tray. It's it's a more central. Applica a central managed application than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, so something you men men mentioned there, yum. Now that, that that's the thing you use to actually update. You know, you use to keep your system updated. Uh, without going too much in detail, and you know, try, try and be fair. Uh, what, what what would you say the main differences is between like a Ubuntu and a Debian or or such based server compared to a CentOS one? Um. Okay. I mean, this is this is more of a religious thing than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. like that. But I think if you if you strip away all of that stuff. You find that I—I I mean, I find—I find, I find uh, you know um, the whole app setup is is is, is good. It, it implements a policy. I think the big difference is that Yum aims at getting a completely different uh, mindset down to what App does. In that, App will try and retain your system's consistency based on localized policy of however your machine is set up. Whereas Yum trusts that the repositories that you're hitting are going to give you that consistency. Right. Oh, okay. so, which is the primary difference. So it's it's about a mindset. So you'll find people who've used Debian all their lives just cannot get YUM. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, you'll find somebody who's used YUM or who's used RPM for a little while. They go back to Apt and they're like, you know, what's going on? You know, they'll see a new package up there. They'll say, right, I want to update to that package. And Apt will refuse to do it because it's going to break something else on your machine. Right. Because it's just, it's just how the repositories are maintained and uh, let's say the ethics or the ethos behind the repository maintenance. Um, Apart from that, they're basically trying to do the same thing. They're trying to give you a mechanism to get new packages on your machine, keep them updated, you know, make sure you've got a means that, you know, you can, if you want to get dependencies in, that, that sort of happens. When you remove stuff, it takes away the right things. I think at the basic, they're doing the same thing. It's just right. how they do it and the policies they implement are slightly different. Okay. So you, st you still use it for doing um, upgrades of packages, but you just have to think slightly differently about, you know, the, the way you get from where you are to where you want to go, basically. Yes. Um, and do you have the, I mean, we have, um, <laughs> I'm trying to draw comparisons because I've never really used CentOS. We have a concept of um, releases every six months. Do, you, do your releases follow Red Hat releases or do you, do you have your own releases or what, what sort of release cycle do you have? We, we basically try and copy Red Hat as much as we can and we normally say that once they have an update out, or once they have a release out, we'll try and get one out within three weeks. Wow. Um, which is something that we've been able to keep till earlier this year when uh, things fell back a little bit and it took us six weeks to get a release out. Um, That's still yeah, pretty so good going though, isn't it? It is, yeah. And once a release is out, it's, it's there for 11 years. Um, seven years under a supported model and I think another three, three and a half years where uh, you're very seriously encouraged not to use it. But if mm. you have it in production, then you know you still get support for it. And, and um, Red Hat try to stick to no uh, kernel API changes or ABI changes from one uh, over a period of time within one release, don't they? That's right. But, I mean, they try to. They have, they have <laughs> broken it once or twice, um, but, but for good reasons. But not as often as we do in Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, again, it's, it's, you know, it's a question of having a different uh, a target audience. Right. Because if you try and implement the sort of um, 
the policy that Red Hat is doing uh, into Ubuntu, you'll have you'll have loads of users complaining that you know it's like if if you read about something on the internet and it says you know this snazzy new graphics card from this company now just works in Linux, and then you go and install CentOS on it, and you're like, well, it's not working. Um, it's it's quite hard explaining to the guy why it's not working. Right. Uh -huh. um, and I think Ubuntu is at a place where they are actually following, um, you know, the latest kernel updates, the, the latest stuff up there, stabilizing it and getting a release out every six months. Um, so I think if you really want to stay on that edge, then then Ubuntu is definitely you know going to give you a better uh, first time user experience. Cool. So um, where do you fit into the uh, CentOS setup then? Um, I am responsible at the moment for the build services um, and the package management policies within CentOS. Okay, so you that, is that the servers that build the, the binary versions of the packages that people download? Yes, the entire build system. Um, and it, and it's, quite, uh, it's quite complex in that, of course, we have to track what's happening upstream and we have to track CVs and we have to track the Red Hat Bugzilla. And do, what um, uh, architectures do you build for? At the moment, what we have in production for CentOS 4 uh, are pretty much all of the uh, upstream architectures. We have uh, x86, of course, x86-64, we've got PowerPC, we've got uh, the Intel Litanium IA64, we've got uh, PowerPC, we've even got S390. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, for CentOS 5 at the moment, we only have uh, the 32-bit the and the 64-bit Intel platform, um, but we are building PowerPC and S390 and Itanium as well. So I think by... 5.4, which should be another two months' time, we should have all of those out uh, in public as well. And who provides the, the infrastructure for, for CentOS, the CentOS project? That's a good question. It's, it's, uh, we're in a very unique position. I don't know anybody else who, who is in this sort of a position in that um, the entire hardware, the entire infrastructure, the entire network is donated to us. There's, uh, we actually have no cost of running the project. Wow, wow. nice one. <laughs> and we have 100-plus uh, servers. Wow in 48 plus data centers in 19 different countries. That is impressive work. Fantastic. And, uh, we have no cost. And, and I, I assume that's including your mirror network and your build servers and, and everything for the CentOS project? This is only the mirrors that we run ourselves, so mirrors which are within CentOS.org. Okay, but other um, people can, like universities or whatever, can they? Yeah, they, yeah. they there's something mirrors. like, I think, 200 plus external mirrors, which are all, well, external mirrors. Fantastic. Things like mirror service and... Uh, you know, kernel load all and stuff like that. And and to do all this, to support all these versions for 11 years and to provide all this infrastructure and maintain and manage it and to develop the distro, h how big is the community around CentOS? Um, the user community is quite large. The developer com community, on the other hand, is probably uh, maybe two dozen people at the moment. Wow. Is that because you, you well, it's hard to say you don't really need to because you, this is going to sound pejorative, but you feed off of Red Hat. For the core distribution, yes, we do. We do a couple of other things, you know. Like, um, it's it's one of the big differences between us and them, as in them being Red Hat, uh -huh. is that at the end of the day, it's, it's a community. So, if you want to do stuff, like, you know, RHEL only ships with PHP 5.1.6, which not a lot of people want to use anymore. So, somebody can stand up and say, "Look, I'll maintain a PHP 5.2.9 or a 5.3.0." Right. And you know, as long as somebody else can set up the uh, QA spec as to what all it should be able to do. Uh, we accept the packages. One of the things is, of course, somebody else has to write the QA spec. Right. Uh, as long as the guy doing it. And we've got, we've got a custom kernel there. We've got um, hardware support for loads of other things like rate cards, HBS, which are not included in the RHEL kernel. Um, and they're all available there. So, yeah, it's just a pretty small group. There's a pretty small group of people. We've had a question from one of our listeners, JA Web Design, on Twitter, asking, we, we talked a bit about um, CentOS being used for servers and in data centers for enterprise use. Um, how, do, how do you think it compares for people who are non-developers? Should is, is CentOS a good distribution for using on the desktop? Um, for people who are not very technical, CentOS is, is, a, is definitely a good option because once you've got it on, you don't have to worry about updates, you don't have to worry about system changes for as long as you really want to at least four to five years. If, you, if you're happy with what it's doing, you don't have to worry about it breaking down. You don't have to worry about, you know, a particular update breaking something else or something that's working today is going away, and stuff like that. So it, it's pretty much like the Ubuntu LTS stuff. So once you've got it on there, it'll just stay working. Right. Um, which, is, which, is, which is definitely good for people who are not very technical, you know, because they don't want to be sort of messing about with 
you know, that a kernel update, yes, they sort of broke something else or, or a security <laughs> patch to open SSH broke something else. Yeah, there certainly are people out there who like stability. <laughs> yeah, we, rightly so. We've had a, uh, another question uh, via Identica this time from uh, Techno Viking. who asks, um, how does Red Hat feel about uh, CentOS and uh, who's the best known entity that uses CentOS as their main distro? Wow. Um, how does Red Hat feel about it? I think you'll have to ask them, but... <laughs> Uh, feedback that we get from the developers, people who are working, you know, the Red Hat engineering teams, um, they don't mind because we feed patches back to them, we feed bug reports back to them, you know, and, and a lot of times, um, because we have our own QA process, we'll find a lot of things that their QA process missed. Wow. And we feed it back to them before their users get to it, you know, and a couple of times they fix stuff for us upstream. Um, you know, and, and so, so the engineering team is quite happy with us. The marketing and sales, I, I don't know. I'm not <laughs> too sure about that. <laughs> well, you can understand it. You know, they've got, a, they've got a product to sell and they've got, you know, a bottom line to reach. So. I, I, I seem to remember reading about a process you could actually turn a CentOS server into a Red Hat Enterprise Linux server via their process. That they, actually, mm. they actually provided ways of doing that. So in many ways, CentOS might actually aid their marketing. If they want support, That's there's true. an easy That's way true. to do it. That's true. I mean, we've heard rumors of, uh, of companies who've had a major problem and they just don't have the technical expertise in-house being able to call Red Hat and Red Hat saying, fine, you buy licenses and we'll fix a machine for you. Um, the, the other part of um, Mike's question related to, you know, what large customers, I guess it's tricky to say because you're a community distro, you know, it's, it's, it's not something you can very easily say who's... Uh, who uses it unless yeah. unless you know that's something you do know and you use that in your promotion I don't know in in terms of numbers large or larger than you know a company that everybody's heard of I don't know um, we know that EDS uses a lot of CentOS uh, right. we know that uh, there's a person called Boris in somewhere in Russia <laughs> who works for a particular Funny company <laughs> and he runs a cluster of about 2200 cores whoa um, wow sorry who did you say CentOS. he worked for I didn't catch that so these are, these are the two big. I mean, EDS as in, you know, somebody who's big whom I've heard of, who right. most of the people would have heard of. Wow. I think Boris, whom nobody's heard of ever before. He's <laughs> got a really big cluster sitting somewhere in Siberia, probably. Yeah, <laughs> probably just to keep warm. Fantastic. <laughs> um, there's one other thing I just wanted to touch on briefly, and that was the, the recent, one of the reasons why, you know, CentOS has come into the news is... Um, one of the issues of the uh, CentOS project leadership. And I just wondered if you could kind of summarize what's been going on and um, where you are and where you'd like to be in, in terms of that leadership. Yeah, I think, um, like I said earlier, the development team, the core team is, is very small, um, which is why if, if one person suddenly goes missing and, you know, he's not really contactable for a period of time, it, it could have, uh, you know, major implications in that it creates a bit of a black hole in the whole ecosystem where nobody else has had access to that information and nobody else has looked into it. And now nobody can because the person who was doing it has gone away. Um, and that's the sort of situation we landed up in. And, um, well, it, it, it's, it's a process that we're on right now. I, we realize that we've made a couple of mistakes and that when the project started, it started with three or four people and just grew from there. And as people came on board, nobody looked back and, you know, sort of thought about what's happening with the organization from the admin point of view, from the finances point of view, from the marketing point of view. Right. Um, which is why we got into a situation where there was a bit of a black hole in that area, which is always concerning because, you know, at the essence of what the project is, it is that stuff which is keeping the project together. Mm. Um, of course, the open letter was went down well in that we actually found the person. And uh, he was able to attend a meeting with us on Friday where we sort of brought up all the issues. We haven't resolved all the stuff uh, because that's going to take a bit of time. Um, but we have started a process where we are sort of setting up a council. We'll probably move towards the foundation soon. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, we'll try and create a, a loop where we can bring in certain, you know, sort of have people come in and, and talk to us about, you know, how to better manage finances, how to better manage pro projects even, um, how to better manage even technical um, know-how and how to make sure that, you know, we don't get into this sort of a situation again before. Sure. As, um, it's sort of something we're working on now. I think in a couple of weeks' time, we should be in a much better position. Do you think this might be um, a fairly typical scenario that sort of startup distros might go through? I think so. Not only distros, I think pretty much any and every project out there who doesn't sort of address this at the right time risks being in the situation. Uh, it's so going to be very difficult, though, isn't it? Because, you know, we, uh, we're a, another example of a small group of people, and the more we do it, uh, the more complex it gets. But I don't know that it's written down, the procedure, or what, you, the, you know, the best practice is written down in anywhere. Do you think that, um, 
you know, the CentOS project team might actually put something down on a on a website somewhere saying, you know, this is some things you really should consider. Well, the processes. Yeah, yeah, the process and and how you should manage um, your project to um, you know to make sure that things sh shouldn't, can't, won't fail. Yeah, I mean that's that's interesting. You mentioned that earlier in the day today. We had uh, we had a conversation with a couple of people at the SBI. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking to a couple of other organizations like this, and we're going to try and actually bring them together, which is interesting because they've never spoken to each other. Like the Linux Fund and the SPI don't always, um, you know, they're not always at the same wavelength even. So we're going to try and get them together and try and see how we could document uh, our best practices Excellent. On, uh, on open source management. Um, we're lucky in that we've got a couple of big companies who use CentOS who are quite concerned by what was happening. Mm. And some of them have uh, offered... Uh, you know, management resources to say, look, somebody can come across and spend a week, ten days with you guys to see what you're up to, and then make recommendations on that process. That's great. Um, and and there's some big companies. I mean, you know, think about let's say the top five uh, consulting companies in the world uh, and things like that. So which 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 completely throws us because we don't realize who are the yeah, people sure. out there who use it. Yeah. So when somebody like that comes knocking on your door, you're like, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I actually know quite a few. Um, applications that actually ship a, a, an installation media based on CentOS with their product. Um, so, I mean, CentOS is actually really in there with a lot of projects that want to do that. So, okay. I imagine they are quite concerned, but it's good news that this is getting resolved, really. Mm. I think the media also blew it up a bit, and the slash chart headline didn't, didn't help anyway. Yeah. I don't think it was really that bad as, as a lot of people thought it was. The project wasn't going anywhere. Um, I mean, the infrastructure was still there. The people who were behind it were still there, and... Uh, well, suddenly got. I mean, well, they say uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. <laughs> that's true. That's true. It was just yeah. You yeah. could do that. The stress, though, I'm sure. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. We had a couple of sleepless nights when uh, you know people were calling up and people you never heard of before saying, "Are you looking for a job? Are you not being paid anymore?" <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "Well, you know what? I was never paid by Santa." Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for your concern. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today and clearing up some of the, uh, the things that CentOS has been looking at and what it is and, and how it all works and hangs together. It's been really interesting to hear from you, and uh, especially as, you know, as an Ubuntu podcast, it's great to get a view from outside the Ubuntu community about some of the other exciting things that are going on there. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on. So, to you guys. So, so if people want to try CentOS or they want to get involved, how can they do that? Um, go to the wiki, wiki.centos.org. And there are titles there which should give you pretty much all the information you need on how to get started, how to get help, how to get the distribution, people you can talk to, stuff like that. Excellent. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers, Gabby. Cheers. Bye. Goodbye. The first long-term support edition of Ubuntu 606 has reached end of life on the desktop. This means that bugs and security issues will not be addressed. Um, presumably unless those packages happen to be in the server version. <laughs> um, it will continue to be supported on the server for another two years. That's till 2011, isn't it? Yeah. Goodbye to the very first LTS desktop. And actually, Dapple was the first one... It felt a bit clean, actually. You know, that, that to me was the first one that really felt a bit polished. Well, it was Dapper. Mm, that was the first nice. one that was uh, delayed as well, wasn't it? Yes, mm. yes, it was. Six weeks? Yeah. yeah. Lots of firsts. Bye bye, Dapper Drake. Who's got the hoist in sauce? Microsoft have contributed some code for their virtualization system Hyper V to the Linux kernel. This in turn has caused some comment and consternation for those who suspect Microsoft of dirty tricks or not abiding by the terms of the GPL. Yeah, big ding dong. Lots of people getting very cross. That's yes. quite fun. Did, didn't opinions. it later materialise that they actually released it because they, if they hadn't released it, they would have made to release it because it was yeah. GPL code they were using anyway. Yeah, they needed to have released it, but they did. So you know, yeah. good stuff. Everything's okay. Improves the kernel. Improves the use of Linux VMs under Hyper V. Good stuff. The Debian project has announced that it will be introducing time-based freezes, not, as widely reported, time-based releases. The freeze will allow developers to concentrate on release-critical bugs and will take place in December every other year. The exact release date will still depend on how quickly the release-critical bugs are resolved. Yeah, so they're still going to release when, when ready, it's just that they've got a target for starting that process. Uh, okay. So the first one will be in December this year. And then it'll be every two years after that. So it means you should see a release of Debian every couple of years. 
give or take a few I months. Did, I did see an interesting bug, uh, not bug, uh, interesting blog post about this relating to the timing and how it would impact on when you get certain packages in Ubuntu and when you get them in Debian and whether you'd actually end up being worthwhile running Debian at all if stuff arrives in Ubuntu first. But Ubuntu's always taken from unstable. Yeah, and mm. it was uh, yeah very confusing for me because I couldn't quite get the grasp of mm. when this stuff lines up. But yeah, it's worth reading. I'll put a link in the show notes. Pi Game 1.9.0 has been released, and if you can think of anything interesting to say about a development library, please write it here. Oh, was I not supposed to read that? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations to the people who work well, on Pi Game, I guess. I, I put that in there because, um, well, I so I have a little soft spot for Pi Game because it's just it's quite a nice little environment to develop. I mean, I, I have in. soft spots for things I've never used as well. <gasps> I won't show you my games I've written. <laughs> oh. oh, I'm sorry. CentOS, the compatible but fee-free version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, has had a leadership crisis after key contributor Lance Davis disappeared, taking with him control of the CentOS.org domain, project funds and rights to the IRC channel. This prompted an open letter to Davis from the key developers on the CentOS website, but the issues are now being resolved. Yeah, it looks like they've um, had a co- uh, conflab with him and um, everything seems to be on the way to being sorted. It is odd that one of the key concerns is control of the IRC channel. You know, <laughs> I mean, to, to actually raise that as a valid, you know, oh, what are we going to do? The, the, the operator from the channel has gone. It does raise a lot of questions about projects who rely on one person often in the very early days and how they can make sure that, that turns into a sustainable um, community. Well, we have that exact, you know, potential issue in, the, in Mark Shuttleworth. Yeah, I mean, we've got the, the Ubuntu Trust Foundation. Foundation, that's the one, yes. yeah, that's, that's supposed to be able to take over. But that, but even if it did take over, that wouldn't run Ubuntu for years and years and years. Not so. in its current form, I no. agree, but I mean, it, we would obviously ship it, it would be the main thing to stop, and, you know... I, and I Canonical, as a going concern, may well find difficulty funding itself. <laughs> yeah, it's... Does it's it, um, um, Let's not speak a lot about um, open source projects as a whole. I mean, should well, they be yeah. controlled by... You know, one uber geek at the top, surely she'll, she'll all be distributed so well, that when the, the guy at the top says, ah, oh, nah, not anymore, can't be bothered. But that's it's where the license the is supposed to come in. So you've got a, an open code repository, anybody can just take it and carry on. Yeah, but organ- just organisationally, I mean, take us four, for example. Hmm. If you can't be bothered next week, then we could move on because that's the way we've always set it up so that it's mm. that yeah. it's seamless organisation. But Tony would take his mixer and go home <laughs> like a <it's> fool. <laughs> okay, so it wouldn't work in that instance. The popular open source gallery software Gallery has launched a survey asking anyone who shares photos online to take part. What's it about? It's about what people want to get out of online photo resources. So not just people who are currently using Gallery, but if you use Flickr or SmugMug or any other photo sharing sites, um, they want to know your opinion. You know, in the long run, hopefully, to get more Gallery users. I think they realised that Gallery 2 was a bit overcomplicated. It was, um, it's very heavy on resources, isn't it? I think so, yeah. And um, they want to find out what they can do with Gallery 3 to make it more attractive to people. Is Gallery 3 under development, then? Mm, yeah. Oh, right. uh, it's looking quite nice, apparently. Oh, cool. As reported on uh, CNET, Matthew Zulik, I presume, a Red Hat's a former CEO and current chairman, stated that Red Hat spends over $100 million a year to advance Linux and open source, uh, mainly through development. Wow. That's good That's going. a lot of money. Yeah. Anybody know how much Canonical do? (laughs) Just genuinely out of curiosity. (laughs) No idea. Okay. Uh, But I don't actually know how much um, 100 million is of a proportion of uh, their their revenue. Red Hat's revenue uh, 2009 was $652 million, according to Wikipedia. That's a fairly big chunk. chunk, Yeah. The rest is all profit. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's free software, so... (laughs) Myro have released version 2.5, including better podcast support and improved audio playback interface. Does anyone here use Miro, Myro? No. no. I used to, but I, I stopped because it was a bit too chunky and because I'm evil. And oh, I but it's now as an improved audio playback interface. Maybe it's less chunky. Actually, it's supposed to start up a lot quicker. Mm. That, that was the main thing. I had it loading when you first logged in, and oh. It, it, oh, it really is a pain in the desktop to actually do that. <laughs> Microsoft have announced that they are uh, opening two Apple-style retail stores. 
Yes, the model. There's a PowerPoint presentation floating around that shows like the interior and and how they have a Guru Bar, like the Apple Genius Bar. They're having a Guru Bar. Well, maybe we should, you know, open. What are they going to call them? Are they going to call them Gurus? I suspect they probably will. Yes. What will we call? Oh God, that's what we have on our T-shirts. A bunch of Guru. guru. (gasps) We should go in there with those on and denial of service attack (laughs) in a free software foundation style. Yeah. The next Ubuntu UK team meeting will be held by IRC at 8 o'clock p.m. BST. That's 7 o'clock UTC p.m. 1900 hours <laughs> if you're in the military. All, all Ubuntu meetings are quoted in UTC because they're uh, global, you see. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Apart from the one here that is quoted in BST. Um, Sunday the 9th of t- August 2009 in hash Ubuntu-UK on the Freenode IRC network. That's basically this Sunday. Yeah, what's going on on that meeting then, Dave? Well, there's an absolute crammed uh, agenda so far. I think mainly uh, talking about the Global Jam. I think that's one of the main things that's covered. Mm-hmm. Ah. So if you want to um, participate uh, or observe, then just join the IRC channel of Hashabuntu-UK, which is our channel. Excellent. Effectively. <laughs> yes. So you could talk about the podcast afterwards or before if you were that so much. But not during. No, well, no. no if they, well, they could if they had it as an agenda item, yes. Well, it could go in any other items as well. Of course, yes. Software Freedom Day this year is Saturday the 19th of September 2009. The Atlanta Linux Fest is also on the 19th of September at the IBM facility on Northside Parkway. The Ohio Linux Fest is on the 25th to the 26th of September at Greater Columbus Convention Center in downtown Columbus, Ohio. And we have a trailer we could play here or not. Come celebrate 40 years of Unix at the Ohio Linux Fest from September 25th through the 27th. If you use GNU Linux, BSD, Open Solaris, or any Unix or Unix-like system, you belong at Ohio Linux Fest. Register free today at ohiolinux.org. The whole world is going to be covered in Ubuntu's Global Jam on the 2nd to the 4th of October 2009. Check out the show notes for a link for more info. I think we've done all the jam games. I think we should make that a sticky on the actual podcast page. Oh, the, uh, yeah. There's always one more to squeeze out. Luck Radio Live 2009 will be on the 24th of October in New Hampton Art Centre, Wolverhampton. We are, and there might be something happening on the Sunday as well. Oh, there yeah. might be, yes. Yeah, we're, we're talking with the Lynx Outlaw, Outlaws guys. If, if you're going along to Luck Radio Live, or not, and we'd like to do something on Sunday the 25th of October... Um, probably some sort of informal bar camp type event. Um, let us know if you'll be around, if you'd be interested in going. Also on the gathering front, FOSDEM uh, next year is on the 6th and 7th of February in the University Libre Brussels. Or, or Bursels, as it says here on this wiki page. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bursels actually sounds a lot better, actually. All right, you go there then, though. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, I couldn't go to FOSDEM this year because I was snowed in. I had like uh, 18 inches of snow. I couldn't, I couldn't go. Didn't you say that last time? That's a shame. Did I? Yeah. Right then, it's time for some Command Line love. <laughs> <laughs> That's not um, what it says on the website. <laughs> this is an interesting one. Um, you sat at your PC and you can't get to the internet, but why not? Your network cable's not plugged in. <laughs> Possibly, or your uh, route has failed, or your switch has failed, or something like that. Well, this um, this command basically enables you to check from um, the terminal whether or not your network cable is in fact attached, and at what speed it's synced to your switch, the next thing downstream on your network cable. That's it. Nice and easy. And it wow. is. I think this is a short enough command line foo that you can reckon. I can read reckon. It out. Yeah. Right. It's the app is. Um, MII hyphen tool, me tool. Uh, run it as uh, sudo and it'll basically tell you if your cable is connected, if you're synced, your interface is synced. Oh, that one was too long for me. Will you put that on the release notes? <laughs> I, think I don't know. Can... Ask, ask the bloke who does the release notes. I think you can also actually use it to set the um, speed and um, because I know in the past some switches have had problems detecting whether it's half or full duplex and 10 or 100 and you can actually force your card to be 
one or other or whatever. Yeah. With so this could be a cheeky way of throttling um, your kids' PCs. Yeah. <laughs> Drop From, them down to 10 megabit. Yeah. Yeah, but how fast is your internet? I'd, well, I'd have all the bad bits and they'd have none. <laughs> and they'd have 10%. Yeah. Get Put gigabit Ethernet in and Good give idea. him 10 megabit. <laughs> and you have gigabit. <laughs> That's an awesome Good idea. idea. And now the second part of our interview with Dustin Kirkland. If you missed the first part, you can hear it in Season 2, Episode 9, The Dimensions of Time. And now, back to the interview. One other thing, you, you mentioned um, uh, remotely administering a number of servers, and I know one of the things you're a um, key developer of is... Um, now, I'm going to say Beobu. How do you pronounce that? Uh, so I'm not a Japanese speaker, but I uh, I have talked to a couple. It's It's basically two syllables, where the first syllable... It's kind of one and a half syllables. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know, do you? <laughs> Byobu. 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 Okay. So the B-Y-O is Byo, and then B-U, Byu. So what Byobu. is it? Uh, so Byobu is um, really just uh, a, a, a nicer front end for uh, GNU Screen. Um, GNU Screen's been around for... Uh, twenty something years now, um, and and I think any any old school Unix admin worth his salt certainly knows what Screen is, if not uses it on a daily basis. Mostly um, to run an IRC client, usually. <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly one one use of it. Um, the most useful aspect to me of Screen before I started working on Biobu was to uh, start running something, disconnect, and reconnect later. So I could start running something in the office. Uh, I could uh, I could background that process if I remembered to start screen um, <laughs> before running that download or an R sync or maybe a, a long build. I could um, I could shut down uh, my local laptop, get in the car, drive home, get back home, reconnect, and see where my long running process was. I could reattach to that same screen. Um, what I came to learn though, uh, reading the uh, 5,000 line man page is that screen's got quite a bit of configuration options, uh, most of which are not unlocked by the majority of screen users. Um, also on the web, I found tons of people sharing their screen RC file, and I started, um, I kind of wanted to, to create a, a best of, um, and beyond that, sort of a sane default for, uh, for Ubuntu and for the Ubuntu server. Uh, from that, it, it's really in, uh, really evolved to a, sort of a what I'd like to think is a a stock command line window manager for Ubuntu Server. Everyone knows Ubuntu Server doesn't ship with a graphical interface. Uh, do you really need a graphical interface, or do you just need a window manager? And I yeah. think Yobu provides a no. really neat, lightweight window manager. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Dave and I are fighting to get, get a question. Um, so, what it, over the top of what Screen already does, which is the you know the the ability to detach from something that's already running. What what do I get? I've, I've seen this funky stuff along the bottom of the screen. What what is that showing me? And what about what's the benefit of having that? Right. So, the, the, there's a couple of key things that Biobu gives you over Screen. First of all, ultimately, Biobu is just a really complex .dot screen RC file. You can actually flatten that that uh, Biobu's configuration to a single screen RC file and then move that file around with you to to other Unix or Linux systems that don't have Biobu installed. But um, ultimately, this provides a couple of things. One uh, is uh, better key bindings. So the, the, the key bindings that Screen provides, there's lots of them, but they're sort of arcane. It's control A, caret, dollar, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's complicated. They so are obscure, taking, yeah. Yeah, I've taken the most commonly used ones and mapped them to the F keys, literally F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, F7, and F, F8 and F9. You know, it's, it's, it's really much easier, single keystrokes. It's keys that hopefully you're not using for other, for other things. Uh -huh. um, you can disable those if, you, if you're running a program like uh, Midnight Commander MC that, that does use that. Right. Um, so key bindings is one thing. Um, a second thing is a uh, the the status bar that uh, we mentioned just a minute ago. So at the very bottom of the screen, there's uh, a a list of toggleable status items that you can turn on or turn off at the bottom of your screen. And this consists of things like your memory usage, your CPU speed, your disk usage, um, users logged on. It's it's pretty stock stuff. The type of stuff you'd 
see in uh, Conky or uh, or a graphical toolbar or something. So, so with all this information down the bottom of the screen, I, I know some die-hard system admins look at that and think, "Oh my God, color!" or "Oh my God, information at the bottom of the screen." Why, you know? You, have you met some resistance from people who you know don't like that information on the screen or think it's a waste of screen real estate, for example? Yeah, I've, it's, I've certainly, uh, yeah, absolutely. I've certainly encountered people who've, who've said that. Um, some have even called the colors tacky. Uh, <laughs> I won't go that far, um, but yeah. So uh, in in Jaunty, if a user types screen, uh, the first thing they're asked is to select a screen profile. That was sort of our discoverability. How do we make screen profiles, as it was called in Jaunty before we renamed it Biobu? Um, that was our, our discoverability. Uh, that that has met more resistance than I initially imagined. Mm -hmm. um, so we've sort of taken a different approach with Karmic. Um, in Karmic, if you type screen, you get screen, the old screen. Your screen sort of flashes once, and you're running screen. There's no Biobu status or anything at the bottom. Um, if you type Biobu instead of screen, you get Biobu, which is the more full-featured um, sort of environment. I guess I, I didn't explain why, why the word Biobu. Biobu is a Japanese word for uh, sort of the decorative folding, folding screen, so those right. you know, like the, the, the elegant painted sort of fancy uh, screens that uh, you might find in a, in, in a, in a room. In a pagoda um, or something. Yeah, so it's sort of a fancier, more elegant screen is, is so, really the, where the name comes from. So to keep the diehard system admins happy, you've got normal screen. And for us that like a little bit of bling, there's um, Biobu with the nice colors. Is there like halfway in between? Can I, can I customize it so that I have you know, the information presented at the bottom of the screen but with no color, for example? Uh, yeah, I mean, so you, the last thing um, that Biobu does as it as it loads all of the, the bits and pieces of the configuration files is it sources your .screenRC file. So you can put any overrides you want in that file, and uh, and it will override anything that was previously set um, within screen's limitations, uh, of course. But um, for the most part, that's that's how I I, I test new features before I'm really ready to. Uh, unleash them on, on other users. <laughs> I'll just add bits and pieces and snippets into my .screen RC file and re relaunch Biobu, and it'll, it'll basically tack that on to the end. And um, that said, now, if users do want to type screen and actually get Biobu, it's, it's trivial for them to do that. They just need a symbolic link from their .screen RC file pointing to their .biobu profile. Cool. Um, so then at, at that point, you can just type screen and, and launch actually Biobu. And from a uh, from a, a real simple user's point of view, um, uh, you and I have been working together a bit with the documentation. But the great thing about Biobu is that it's all done in uh, shell scripts, so it's actually quite easy to get in there uh, and change things yourself. Yeah, that's right. So thanks, Simon. Simon has helped quite a bit in getting the documentation into uh, into a format that hopefully users can read and understand. <laughs> um, <laughs> Although I'm slacking a bit at the moment, I know, but um, but there you go. No, it, it's it's looking good. I'm 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 really pleased someone was able to help uh, uh, help with the documentation aspect. But yeah, the idea is to to make screen more accessible to to users um, without uh, having to read thousands of lines of of, of a shell man page, um, and to to be able to to do simple window management in a in a command line interface uh, without thinking about it very much. We've um, we've had a number of questions from uh, from the world of Twitter and Identica, and uh, one of which is um, just touched on the on the final um, product. Um, uh, Josh Holland has asked, uh, "Are we going to see eCryptFS as a default anytime soon?" So, what is eCryptFS to start off with? And uh, uh, are we okay. see it? So, yeah, so eCryptFS is a I guess another project that I've worked on and maintained upstream for for a couple of releases. Now we started in. EcryptFS is a cryptographic file system. It's actually in the Linux kernel itself. So there's a lot of encrypted file systems and different ways of doing encryption. E with EcryptFS, the couple of key features, um, each individual file is encrypted as opposed to, say, the entire uh, device, the entire block device being en encrypted. Um, there's a couple of things I like about that. One is that uh, you can move those files around, so you can rsync individual files as opposed to our syncing an entire uh, you know multi gigabyte uh, uh, encrypted LVM volume um, also it means that 
if a couple of bits go wrong somewhere in, let's say, a backup or something like that, you don't lose all of your data. You, you lose that file, but it's much better than, um, you know, try taking a, a, a giant GPG file, twiddling one bit, and see what happens. You, you can't un encrypt that, that file at all. Um, it's also in the kernel, so it's quite performant compared to uh, some other encryption solutions. So in Intrepid, we, uh, we embarked on some work on the server team called uh, the encrypted private directory. Users can optionally set up uh, a single folder inside of their home directory called uh, private. And your home private directory would be eCryptFS mounted automatically when you logged in, and you could store, you could optionally store your most sensitive, most critical data there. Um, and what we ended up doing in, in the Intrepid time frame, um, some of us would put stuff like our, uh, say, our dot .evolution directory, our, uh, our .firefox directory, and so forth, uh, .ssh, for instance, um, in the private directory, and then symlink them, symlink them back to where ah, they yeah. expect it to be. So it appears um, to actually be there. Ah. Yeah, so, so the, the pro various programs, evolution and so forth, looking for a .evolution directory, it would just chase down that symlink, and the data that got written to disk would be encrypted, um, but, uh, but uh, not... Um, uh, it, it, it wouldn't be able to look for it in its normal location. Um, so wh why use this over full disk encryption? Uh, well, you know, full disk encryption certainly has its benefits, and there are places where it might make sense to continue using that. But for one thing, when you turn on your computer um, with full disk encryption, your computer will immediately start asking you for a password at the very beginning. And mm -hmm. so some of the work we've done getting the, the boot speeds down the five or ten seconds in, in Ubuntu you you lose that if you're waiting at a um, at a <laughs> at a prompt before you've even booted the system, yeah. right? So the key here was to to actually use the passphrase that you have to enter anyway uh, if, when you log into the system and use that to mount uh, an encrypted uh, private directory. Uh, in Jaunty, uh, it didn't take it wasn't that difficult for me to to extend that work instead of just encrypting um, home slash private to encrypt all of home. Um, and that's worked pretty well. There's a bit of polish that we've needed to do uh, before we, we make it a default, like um, like your your user your user asks. Um, in fact, I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we're going to make that a default. Uh, I think there's just too many Ubuntu installations out there where no encryption is really required mm -hmm. at all. Um, but there are many users who do want that. And uh, you Michael, think we'll we'll have it as a tick box in, in the live install perhaps? Yeah, exactly. So in Jaunty you had to enter a, a special parameter, uh, a kernel parameter on the live CD uh, boot line. Um, user setup equals encrypted home or something like that. I didn't know you could do that. Yes, yes. I've actually got to look it up. I've blogged about it. Um, I've got to chase down my blog every time I need to do it because I <laughs> It's a little bit cryptic, uh, but the... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse the pun. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so it is It is not easily discoverable, but it's there. Um, basically, if you add that line on your on your kernel boot, um, when, you, um, uh, w when you get to the page where you're choosing your username and your password, there will be an option at the bottom which says, I require a password to log in and decrypt the contents of my home directory ah, on the radio. There's okay. Log in automatically, which is no password, and that's obviously uh, incompatible with encrypting a home directory because you have to have a password. To yeah, it, sure. Right. Um, the second option is just require a password to log in. The third option is require a password to log in and decrypt my my home directory. Um, so that that option was obscured. In the default desktop install, my goal for Karmic, um, and I still have a lot of work to do before we can make that happen. My goal for Karmic is for that to at least be an option um, in the default desktop installation. Great. Now, now, Dustin, talking of your blog and various encryption things, I remember some months ago you uh, you actually set a challenge, basically trying to open the encryption to the masses. <laughs> um, I mean, you, I mean, do you want to explain the basically the concepts behind that? Whether you're going to set another one. Yeah, so that it was a lot of fun actually. Um, it was kind of a, a weird coincidence. So I read a, a really good book uh, of fiction uh, late last year. It's called Damon by uh, Daniel Suarez. Um, it's really smart, kind of cyber cyber thriller, I guess. 
I traded a couple of emails with the author um, and uh, basically said, hey, good book, enjoyed it. Uh, I, I sent it from an Ubuntu.com address. His response was, it, it warms my heart that, that uh, this, my book struck a chord in the open source community. Aww. And that started a, a neat little dialogue. So he sent me a, a couple, or I guess his publisher sent me a couple of copies of the book with the stipulation that I give it away in a contest of some kind on my blog. And uh, the publisher didn't really make any any requests. I, I asked for more information, and she just said, I'll just give it away. I don't really care how, but make it a contest. Make it something fun. Um, and so during the, the Christmas break, I spent some time and created a series of uh, three different challenges, um, where these challenges, the first one was pretty simple. It was basically set up an encrypted home directory, hash a couple of things, um, that would hash to a known value that, that I knew, use that hash to decrypt a, a file, uh, and answer a riddle inside of that file and send um, the secret email address that was in the encrypted file the answer. And the first person who does that wins a copy of the book. So did Dave, um, did Dave win the book? Th- did Dave win the book? I don't think Dave won the book. <laughs> no, I only, I only asked that because I know he didn't. <laughs> I think Dave Dave may have been the only person who actually solved all three challenges. Wow. Win. <laughs> yeah. So yeah he did not. something right. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, um, for future competitions, can I just request that you actually think about the British people and actually, you know, don't release it sort of in the early afternoon. Release it in the morning, because otherwise people spend up, you know, perhaps staying up till four in the morning or something silly. <laughs> people being with you. I, I think I would take that into consideration, except that two of the three winners were from the UK, and I did not <laughs> take that into account uh, as I ran this contest, and it cost me a dollar, dollar and a quarter to ship it to uh, Iowa or wherever the, the third one went to, but the first two, I think, cost more than the book to, to ship. <laughs> <laughs> we, f- we feel yeah. your pain. Yeah, we should have been there. For, for what was worth, the one you sent me um, was, was, was obviously the American edition, and all the Americanisms of the American way of spelling things, I found infuriating as oh, I went through the book. Oh, good lord, he just... <laughs> but, but thank you very much, Dustin. He's never grateful. <laughs> um, uh, I, think, I think that's everything we wanted to... Uh, yeah, I did. To come yeah, up. yeah, that's really good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks, guys. I really appreciate the opportunity. I love listening to the podcast. Oh, oh that's yeah. very kind of you to say. Just, uh, and on a very important note, is your hair still long or have you had it cut? Oh, my hair is very short now. Okay. So okay. anyway, the incisive questions. It's summertime. It's quite hot in Austin. 106 or something insane like that right now. Wow. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us, Dustin. It's been great having you on. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It's time for some swag. It's that competition time. £20 worth of goodies from the Canonical uh, shop uh, is available. One of um, of our old uh, vouchers. Yeah. Old ones, <laughs> one yeah, of the old ones. Yeah, just a few spare ones. The return of the, the yeah. much loved canonical shop voucher. <laughs> yeah, just we thought we'd do something uh, slightly different with this one as well. A bit wacky. So we're going to give you the an answer, and you've got to tell us the question. <laughs> be as inventive as you like, uh, but bear in mind if we're going to read them out, they have to be you know a bunch of code of conduct friendly and not contain any swearing. Because, because swearing does in fact upset us as well. <laughs> of course it does. So the answer is Pulse Audio. What's the question? Send your questions to competition at ubuntu-uk.org by Monday the 17th of August. And anybody can enter this competition. It's open to the whole world as long as you've got an email address. It's been called many things, including Gerald, Harold, Phyllis, Dustafear, and my original ecosphere, which I still think is valid. But it's not. Okay. So the first post we have in the Margaret. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> Margaret. <laughs> is a post that was made to the Ubuntu UK mailing list about um, something called Gnome Global Menu. Dave, you put this in here. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it seems to be a way, I mean, on all your applications... Um, you, you've always got this sort of file edit and all the different options at the very top of the menu. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, a concept that seems to be come from the, the Mac operating system is rather than having it on each application, it adds it to the very top. To, to, so it adds it to where the menu oh, is. Oh, the thing at the very, very top of the yeah, screen. Yes, so your application. Right. And it's locked it, yeah. to the top of the screen. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, actually waste, uh, you actually waste quite a lot of space in your own application there. 
Um, and what the one line in each window that has the file menu? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it does sound like quite a nice idea. It's a unified place as so well. This, so this thing lets you do that on Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, the reason I, I really brought this up wasn't specifically just just to talk about that particular entry. Uh, it was also thinking about well, th- there are. I mean, the, the, the difference between Ubuntu and Debian uh, is Ubuntu tries to pick the best things of all the of, of all the free software things and put them in, in one installation. Yeah. Now, um, what, what, what do you other people think about actually uh, using non-defaults and things like that? I mean, I mean, what's the long-term effects of doing that? Surely you do that anyway. First thing you do after you install is add other stuff. Uh, yeah, but when it's something quite critical to the actual desktop there, um, presumably that actually replaces some. I, I haven't actually tried it, but presumably it actually replaces something else. Right. So then you're actually being asked to remove Ubuntu desktop meta package, aren't you? Do I don't know. I've, I've not I, tried I, I, Well, I mean, as a long as other concept, I mean, you, you, you probably find things where that has happened with other applications. Do, do you mean, is it significant if Ubuntu chooses to differ from the GNOME defaults significantly? No, I think it's the other way. If you, does it, does it, I'm, I'm interpreting the question as, does it matter that I am changing my desktop? to be different from Ubuntu. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what effect? Get the cause? I mean, clearly, um, you're probably not going to get the updates and things like that if you've mm. installed it from a third-party source. Well, I guess that's a question for our listeners, really. Yeah. What do they do? Because, I mean, we all modify ours. I mean, you're running Crunchbang. Yours looks like you're using a dust theme there, slightly different from the normal. And you've got a very large size uh, I know. panel. I guess this is panel true. Oh. At, at the bottom and top of the screen and toolbars and stuff. And I know Tony uses... Pretty oh, stock. Pretty standard. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, 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 I actually but set up on... I just use my computer. I wanted to ask the listeners what they do to their machines that's different from stock Ubuntu. Not just adding packages, but, you know, real, like, hardcore changes, like moving the panel. Well, I mean, I can actually state that with Mrs. Davies' laptop, I actually uh, set up Avant um, Navigation Bar. Oh, the Windows Navigator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does she listen, though? <laughs> Only when I make her. <laughs> well, there's another sort of interesting connotation to that and this is, as you said it was a Mac OS style way of doing this menu bar and we've already commented in previous episodes that the login screen is very uh-huh. Mac OS style. and the Avant window navigator that Dave chose is, that, um, that's it's like a Mac is that the dock. thing that looks like the, the dock at the bottom dock at the yeah. screen yeah is Ubuntu increasingly yes. following the Mac OS design um, model yes there are and so many that things thing? that are following that but anyway yeah Compass if we ask yeah, yeah. yes but is it a good thing you can't just make a noise. Well, you're, ask, you're asking the guy who's bought a Mac. So. <laughs> and, owns, and owns how many iPods? Two. One of them was given to me, though. Freedom. Okay, well, best listeners will let us know if they think it's a good thing if we're following the Mac. Not if design. it's a good thing that Alan has a Mac. But <laughs> if it's a good thing that people, you know, change their stuff. And also if it's a good thing if people are moving towards a Mac look. For and you if you do try different things, what different things do you try? Yeah. Cyril Brulois, I almost certainly pronounced that incorrectly, um, posted on the Debian Devel list. Um, he maintains the Blender packages, and he'd like to know what to do with packages like Blender, where it, it's not quite abandonware, but where the upstream community isn't particularly interested in helping people package it and get it into mm. distributions. So he says that they don't really care about being distributed. They want people to download it from Blender's website, and they don't worry about security patches particularly. Um, they've also got their own priorities that aren't security and um they use a lot of embedded code and things like that which yeah. obviously makes it difficult for uh, distributions like debian to, to distribute it um and things like Sinalera do the same thing as well with sort of embedded binaries and things like that that make it difficult to do and handbrake does as well handbrake oh, right. bun- they bundle in their own ffmpeg and the libav codecs that go with it and stuff and that makes it hard F- um handbrake isn't even in debian or ubuntu in the repos I think partly for that reason, but Blender is. And I mm. think this post was talking about the possibility of orphaning the package and not putting it in Debian anymore. <laughs> and and basically, if it's not in Debian, then it probably won't be in Ubuntu. It basically sounds like he's had enough, really, of trying to keep it all together. Yeah. Well, I mean, quite a few applications actually pin to a specific version of certain libraries and things like that. Yeah, but that's different. That's pinning it. So oh, no, no, loading, but, but what I mean is, if it says it requires version x point y no that's that's not the same then they have to ship their own don't they no that's not what this is saying they they're this, he's saying that in the in the package that you get with blender you get the ffmpeg libraries it's not 
a separate this package depends on FFmpeg. Blah. Oh yeah, no, no. I oh, sorry. I, I know. I, I know what you say. I'm saying the same thing. I'm saying well, if they if they actually do depend on a specific version, then it actually does make sense in some ways to actually ship the version within the actual application. Yeah, I'm not sure they actually depend on a specific version or more their own patches that they've put in that specific. That's version. That's nice. I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got to get security fixes into the bundled version as well. Oh, yeah, like, you know, it's just a nightmare. Yeah, but it goes to show there's a lot of work going into these sort of very complex packages. And, and it's not always as straightforward as one thinks, because I, I mean, I asked about having Handbrake packaged, and a lot of people kind of went, oh, God, no, because the of the problem with, you know, having extra stuff bundled in with it, and Handbrake is much the same. The upstream don't really care about having it packaged. Alan Lord, the open sorcerer, successfully gets a refund for his Windows license from Amazon. He blogs about it on his blog. It's a good place for it. Yeah, yeah. smart move. <laughs> yeah, he was quite chuffed with this. Yeah, he basically phoned them up, I think, and said, yeah. I want, I don't want to use this, this Windows thing that came with my... It was a netbook, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I haven't accepted the end-user license agreement, and it says I can get a refund if I don't accept it. Because it actually says that in Microsoft's license terms, doesn't it? If, yeah. if you don't accept it, you can ask for a refund. No, it doesn't. It specifically says if you, if you don't accept the license, return the product, is what it says. Mm. And by saying return the product, it isn't explicitly saying return Windows. Whether it means the hardware or just yeah, the software. Right. In their, yeah, they, their interpretation is return the whole thing. Yeah. But yeah, he got, what was it, £40 or something something like for that, an XP, yeah. now, XP home license? Now, a few people have done this, and they've also done it with, uh, with Dell and things like that. But it's the first, I think it's the first time I've heard of it from Amazon. Yeah, the unfortunate thing is someone else asked a few days later, and they said no. Yeah, and I, was say, I wonder what Amazon do with the licenses. I wonder what Dell do with the licenses. I suspect they just, they just them back? Ro- I, I, them in the bin where I, they I think be. they just write it off. To be honest, yeah. mm. I'd be surprised wow. if it ever gets back to Microsoft. I don't think they ever tell them in any way. I mean, the the guy from I think it was Sheffield last year, maybe two years ago, who got a refund from Dell for his XP license. I'm pretty sure Dell actually wrote him and said it's a, a payment in gratuity. It's not. It's not a refund. They never actually said it was a refund. They said it was a gratuity payment, which technically means they're not going to ask Microsoft for that because it's a... Well, it's a it, it doesn't debt. necessarily say that. What, no, what, it doesn't, what I it think, doesn't, it what doesn't I, say refund. Yeah, but what I think they're really saying is is so they don't form a company precedent for that. Sure. I, I think that's the main reason for saying that is so he doesn't publish it letter and say, well, he got it. So it's doing it as a goodwill gesture. Is, yeah. You know, it's not a very sustainable model for the hardware manufacturers, is it? If they're paying £40 to Microsoft for the license and then for a proportion of those machines, they have to pay £40 to the user in addition... I mean, the, the overheads or the profit margins on these hardware things are so small anyway, it's going to easily wipe out any profit yeah. from those. And if it if Ubuntu or Linux carries on getting more and more popular and more and more people want their license money back, it's not a sustainable model. There's a new um, a website, news website for Debian. It's at uh, news.debian.net. It's um, completely unofficial, apparently. Mm. Yeah, it's got quite a few interesting news things about it, about DebConf on there. Yeah, I think it's comparable with the Ubuntu news website, which is called The Fridge. Yeah. There are free copies of the official Ubuntu book available for Loco teams. John o. Bacon, the bearded community wrangler, blogged about it. And I think you get a copy of, a copy of the book for each Loco, is that there's, right? There's two books. Two books? Yeah, two books. Oh, there's each an orangey one and a ready one. A serve one and desktop one, isn't there? And well, yeah, that's the technical description. <laughs> orangey and ready, I prefer. <laughs> and we're also getting a couple for the podcast as well. Give away yes. the competition, which no, incidentally they haven't replied no, no, to email I'm, yet. I'm keeping them. We're not giving them away. <laughs> Another prize that goes into Simon's book. Simon's whoa, very whoa, big whoa. bookshelf. <laughs> Time for your feedback now. Oh, and crazy. Nathan Howard has emailed in to let us know that he found this show on Miro. Oh, we were just talking about that earlier yeah, in the see. news, and he's listened to the entire archive, which is well beyond the call of duty. I wow. think. And he's now bang up to date. Um, he also lets us know that the oldest computer he runs Ubuntu on is an abacus. And he <laughs> sent us a, a photo of it booting up a distro called Abantu, as in abacus and Ubuntu, uh, which we'll put on the website. On the Do you show think notes. listening to all the old episodes sent yeah. him over the edge? <laughs> I think it might have done. <laughs> Dave Hibbert's emailed in about the Ubuntu Certified Professional Qualification. He says, I work for a Wintel sysadmin at a bank who has been looking at changing to an open source for a number of years. My question is, do you think due to the recession, more big businesses will start looking at open source and Ubuntu server as a viable business model? 
Do you think it would be advantageous to study for the Ubuntu Certified Professional exam as a result? Hmm. That's a good question. Big businesses. How, how much no. is um, support for Ubuntu Server? How much is support for Microsoft 2003 Server? Well, and yeah. How many Microsoft admins can you pick up for ten a penny these days? Oh yeah, but if the bank itself is looking at moving, it makes sense to have. If the bank's made the decision to go for whatever reason, and there might be scalability or whatever. Yeah, stability, that, I mean, there security. are obviously technical reasons why you might move to Ubuntu Server. I'm just yeah. wondering if the financial reasons are immediately well, obvious we haven't actually mentioned this but there was um remember the you used to see in the trade rags about the uh Lon- the Lo- london stock exchange being all run on microsoft infrastructure there was it was uh, big in a lot of trade press it was yeah. and they had adverts about it well they're all they're throwing it all out now because it all crashed oh good on one day and they lost a lot of trade so they're putting all linux stuff in in its place apparently mm-hmm. and it, so, it was linux based uh pre- previous yeah. to that wasn't it so there are there are financial institutions that are using you know, red hat and things primarily i suspect mm. um to run all their their, their stuff so if, if your business is looking at going over to open source and it's ubuntu that they're looking at in this particular case hey yeah get certified yeah magic make yourself indispensable in this economic time <laughs> but, but, but i would imagine particularly as uh ubuntu is really powering out the uh the cloud at the moment um, compared to a lot of other distributions yeah I'm not sure how many banks would run on the cloud but well no on their own private cloud oh right Bod Suter emailed to tell us about a a new community created tutorial website for Ubuntu called ubuntuts.com that was close Uh, the tutorials (laughs) uh, cover things like programming in Python and installing applications yes they're text based tutorials rather than sort of video or audio or anything oh right so we've got show me do for the video ones Mm -hmm. and then ubuntuts for the text based ones yes and somebody emailed in who'd been listening to all the old season one shows again i don't think it was the same guy as the earlier earlier on this thing he's saying what was the name of that company that does all the videos and it's showmedo.com laura tchaikovsky see i got the name right there wrote to tell us about a new website to help people find out about open source events near them. Laura writes, FossEvents.org is an open source event aggregation site uh, created by the Peer Directed Project Centre, a not-for-profit organisation that operates Freenode. Our goal with this new site is to make it easy to find open source events near you that interest you. Many of us have missed events that were right around the corner because we didn't know about them until it was way too late. It's a really funky site, isn't it? It's pretty good, and it's a really good idea, I've got to yeah. say. There aren't all that many events on it just yet, but it would be great to see it flourish in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, there's no reason why we can't put you know events in there for UK and other people put stuff from other regions in there, and yeah. it just bulks up to be you know a global Do you resource. think this could go accurate enough to actually have just a normal monthly lug meet on there? Yeah, absolutely. The that's, the, thing. that's the yeah. sort of thing they've got on there. It's not big conferences and expos well, it's not just big conference and expos they've oh, got right. you know lug meetings here there and everywhere or you know small smaller scale events as well if you're having an install fest or something like well, that. i've not looked at it yet but is it searchable like by location so if i'm going to go to manchester next week can i throw manchester in there and it'll show me what's going on in manchester for the next two weeks it's pretty early days but i think that's where they're aiming for i think at the moment it's kind of country and date, well, and date based. In the UK. And yeah. date based. So you could say you could click on the date and say I'm going to be there that that date, okay. and then the, see the what's dating stuff in there. Yeah. So yeah. I could actually add like an install fest at Tony's house on the 29th, and yes. everyone would come to your house on the 29th. Yes. Are we going to have one of these events like they have in the newspapers about people turning up to Facebook <laughs> parties at Tony's house? Hey, I heard there was going to be an install fest. Yes, you're not invited, any of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm even thinking about the people who are in this room right now. To be honest. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us on email, you can do so via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. Please do, nobody does. I would like to, to receive one voicemail before the next episode recording. That's your I challenge. W- all right, I'll phone up. <laughs> <laughs> Again, excluding people in this room. You can send us your comments on Identica via identity.ca slash UUPC or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash UUPC, as well as getting updates from recording sessions and your chance to put questions to our interviewee guests. Mm. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenote IRC network. Do you want a Facebook uh, fan page? Search for Ubuntu a UK podcast. How many are up to, Tony? Apparently we have got an awesome 175. Ooh, come on, 200. Rocketing yeah. up. Let's see if we get 200 by the end of the year. 
We welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews or rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. Thanks also to our network of community mirrors listed on the website. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening.